And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host, Shane Bailey. Glad you could join us in for another episode here. We are right in the middle of our two-a-days. Uh, we're going to cover two teams from every team, one east, one west from the SEC. Uh, we've covered a number of teams already, so we're getting into the thick of things as far as the number of teams involved. I know we've already had Arkansas and Missouri, uh, a couple of others that are out there that I've already forgot about uh, that, that we've talked about. It's just been a blur. Um, but it, because most of that's because this week is my focus, and that's Ole Miss uh, and Vanderbilt. So I have with me here at the round table Chad Caldwell. Welcome, Chad. Shane, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, if you noticed, you have the orange cord in order in honor of Drew and, and his UT loveliness. Yeah, I noticed that, but I'm just going to let it pass for right now. And, and Cole's got the uh, yellow for your Vanderbilt Cole Hodges, Ole Miss. Thanks, Shane, for having me. Well, glad you could make it. I know you had a long weekend. We talked a little bit off air about that, so uh, glad you could uh, pony up and make sure you were here today. So we, we appreciate you guys being in here. But we're going to cover just a couple of little things first, and then we're going to get right into the uh, conversation about our, our two-a-days. Uh, first off and foremost, we are the uh, SCC SRT, and you can find us on iTunes under SEC Sports. If you search that, uh, you're going to find us near the top there up at Stitcher Radio. You can do a search there. We also are on Facebook at SEC SRT. Uh, have a lot of conversation going on there as well as on our website, uh, www.secsrt.com. Uh, if you've met, been to the uh, website recently, there's been some extra uh, blog posts that have been put up there. And now that we're getting right into the heart of football things, you're going to see some more of those things happening uh, on the website as well as these podcasts. So make sure you're checking in regularly on the on the website uh, and Twitter, SECSRT. Just put out there now that uh, on Twitter and Facebook that we are streaming live on Ustream right now as well. So hopefully... Uh, if you're out there, you're watching it, uh, want to see what's going on, you can do that as well. So lots of ways to join the uh, action. Uh, be involved. Love to get your feedback on the, the podcast via iTunes, the website, uh, or Twitter. Uh, however you'd like to con converse back with us, we'd love to have you guys. Uh, but the way we do this is uh, the two-a-days is basically going to be a uh, simple format. The, the first part of it, we'll talk media days because... Uh, we normally talk news, any news that's happened in the SEC, and this week uh, was SEC Media Days for football. So probably a few things to talk about uh, that came out of uh, Birmingham this year for the Media Days. Uh, then we'll get right into our two-a-days, and this week we will discuss Ole Miss and Vanderbilt. So uh, with that, guys, uh, the SEC all-preseason team was uh, announced at Media Days, and uh, Unfortunately, your, your teams didn't have a lot to cheer about or talk about there. I think uh, two players from Vanderbilt, and, and, and I don't have a lot of room either being a Kentucky fan. Uh, Ole Miss was right there with Kentucky having just one player uh, on those. Um, but, uh, you know, the, there's still a lot of stuff that, that you guys have to be uh, hopeful for uh, as the season progresses. But was there anything from media days that you guys wanted to take away that you – Chad? I think I want to talk about some of, like, the rule changes – Okay, yeah. Uh, especially, you know, the kickoff rule that they're making now. You kick off from the 35, and they uh, – are they kicking off from the 35 or the 40? 35. I think it's 35, yeah. A touchback, you get it at the 25. I just think that takes a big element out of the game. They're, they're, they're following the NFL in that aspect, aren't they? Yeah. Usually just – I mean, I guess they have a lot more injuries during the kickoffs, but I think that that's a big element, especially in the college game, that – I mean, you, you can have a big advantage on it just by a big ret by a good return man. Yeah, and and you see a lot of those uh, ace wide receivers do are that that second uh, return man or or the main return man in a lot of situations. I mean, you look at uh, the way that can completely change a ball game. Last year, Arkansas um, was that against UT where they had mm -hmm. that run back. Mm -hmm. I mean, that completely yeah. changed that ball game uh, in Arkansas's favor. And would that have happened? Yeah, I think what you're going to see also is is coaches getting greedy and working on like a pooch kick that's not going to go. That's going to be like at the goal line, so they can try to run down there and keep them from from getting to the twenty. So instead of making them uh, run it back, as opposed to having the touchback. Right. So th yeah, yeah <laughs> that's going to. I mean, so many that just brings up a whole world of uh, problems for me. I think of because so many teams, if you look at one of their weaknesses, it's their kicker or their punter. Right. Uh, and so you're, you're going to ask even more of that, that one position where, uh, you know, before it was just kick it as hard as you can and they're going to run it back. You know, now it's, all right, I need you to kick this at 80% 
so that you're only going to get it within the five uh, and, and do that on a consistent basis. I think you're going to, I don't know, maybe see more of them end up going out of bounds in that situation. I don't know. Could be. It's, it's going to be interesting to see which teams favor which kind of style. You may, you may have some coaches say, hey, just kick it through. We'll just give, them, give it to them on the 25. Then you have some that just say, put it down there. Let's see if we can let's see how close we can get them to the end zone. Cole, anything you wanted to take away? No, I, I agree with Ch I agree with Chad. I mean, it's going to be interesting if you've got a if you've got a solid defense. I think that you'd see more coaches more coaches going on kicking it to the end zone into the end zone, getting them the ball on twenty five, and then you know teams like teams like Chad and my team. I mean, hit, Vandy's got a little bit better defense than Ole Miss, but uh, but you know we'll uh, maybe have to change our game plan and to, uh, you know get some speed on the kickoff team, get down there and try to keep them in, pin them inside the twenty. Um, media days, you know, the other hot topic media day that came out for me was uh, the new playoff format. Uh, it's interesting to see how many coaches in the SEC are pro uh, the 14 playoff and even want to uh, possibly expand it to, uh, you know, to uh, eight teams. So um, what do you all think about that? We, I've, I've talked playoffs, and I know Chad's not been on a while. So, uh, you know, I, I've given my thoughts on that. Uh, expanding it to eight, I think I think that's going to happen. But what I think you're going to see is when this whole set of rules come out, that you've got mm -hmm. 10 to 12 years um, before you're going to be able to see a change come out. They've they've put something in place here so similar to the BCS um, before. I mean, how many years have we had that? Was it 97, 98? 98. Year. And, and uh, so we're looking at 14 years before we had a change with that. Uh, you're going to see a number of years down the road before you're going to see that. And I do think that uh, this is going to – greed's going to come into play to, to some degree, and they're going to realize that how – look how much more money they're making now going to a four-team playoff. Uh, if they go to eight, there's just that much more money on the table to get. So uh, greed's always going to win, it seems like, in football, whether it's the SEC, whether it's the NCAA, whether it's the BCS, wh whoever – whatever – um, group you're talking about there, they all want to try to get as much of that piece of the pie as they can. Uh, and sometimes you just got to get a bigger pie uh, so that everybody can be happy. And, and I think that's some of the reason why uh, they've gone to this four-team program. Uh, last year was a great opportunity for them to do that. Uh, if, if things went uh, uh, just a, a flip of a switch differently, you would have had Oklahoma uh, playing versus Alabama. And so – that whole controversy having two SEC teams or two teams from the same conference uh, making the national championship would have squashed all rumors about having this, and we wouldn't be having this conversation about a four-team playoff. They would have never met in June and voted on this. That's my feelings. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, that was enough for them to see. You know, they knew the writings on the wall. They've heard the rumblings for years. I gave them a great opportunity because that happened out there to get other conferences that might not have been for it uh, before this on board and because they were able to do that uh, they've opened this up and they realized how much money's out there they were able to keep the NCAA out of this program again out of the bowl system uh, they've got their hand in the basketball but they have no association with the football bowl system or with the BCS uh, and they're doing the same thing with this four-team championship so they're able to help eliminate some of that money going to, and being diverted to the NCAA. Uh, it's staying within the bowl system to some degree uh, from all indications the way they're going to do the rotation of the, of the, the games. Uh, as well as that, they're going to keep it, uh, you know, all the, all the conferences are going to become richer because of it. Uh, have they decided how they're going to do, who's going to pick the four teams? Is it still going to be the BCS? Or are they going to have a committee? Or it's a com From what, what I've seen, there's a committee. Now, who that committee is made up of, what criteria they're going to use to do that. They still have lots of time to discuss how that's going to come out, and that's not been discussed. There's rumors about how it will come into play. Um, it might be like a selection committee like they do for the NCAA tournament to some degree, but there, it's not been out there how that's all going to play out and who's going to be on that selection committee, what criteria they're going to use, are they going to use um, what computer rankings, if they are using computer rankings, how are they made up? Are they using RPI? Are they using strength of schedule? Are they using margin of victory? None of that is being discussed on what's going into their decision making when they do have those individuals in the room. Uh, I'll just say that I'm, I'm glad that they finally have some sort of playoff, even if it is just four teams. But, you know, the first year of that playoff, there's going to be debate over who should be that fourth team. All right, that whoever the number five team feels like they should be the number four, 
and vice versa. So then if they bump it up to eight, there's just always going to be some kind of controversy about who should be in the in the playoff format. But I am glad they're going to it. I just hope they figure out a system that everybody will you know, get on board with. I agree. Um, and you did mention, Chad, about going to eight. I do feel they're obviously going to have to test the waters with the four. Um, and there is going to be some. Um, there's going to be some heat because people will uh, will always say the fi- the fifth the fifth team and the fourth team are so close. And who's it going to be? If there's eight, you possibly have. Coach Spurrier brought this up during media days because he's been a big proponent of uh, you know playoff and for some time. He actually brought up the uh, the idea of going to um, the eight team playoff and having the uh, six major BCS conferences all their champion, no matter you know. Whoever their champion was, determined by, um, you know, best record or championship game like the SEC and most other conferences, have them in there, and then two at-large teams. But then again, you bring up the, the question of okay, those at-large teams, who are they going to be? So I think there's always going to be controversy, but I'm glad we're going down this road. I don't think I like that that idea from Spurrier. I mean, I think if, if somebody else would, if James Franklin would have said it, would you have liked the idea? Probably not. Okay. Because I, I, if you take every conference champion you know like one year the acc wake forest won the acc well probably the seventh best team in the sec could beat wake forest so i just think you got to take the best teams well and and you also got to look at what the the major six conferences are right now i mean is the big east is one of those currently and <laughs> we're all rolling our eyes <laughs> yeah exactly i mean you you take that into consideration and look at what's in the big east right now from the bas- uh, f- football standpoint I mean, even their basketball teams are leaving them because it's, you know, it's almost like it's a rat or a sinking ship and the rats are trying to run to dry ground. And I'm not trying to call Syracuse rats by any stretch of imagination. Um, but they've got a great basketball program. But they understand that, you know, when all this gets shaken down at the end of the end of this, I don't see six teams surviving. And I've been a proponent from the very beginning that uh, the little to protect these little guys, the little conferences, these mid majors and and. You know, I see a time where after this 10, 12 years, it might be that there is just four super conferences. Uh, and they're the ones that are going to have the playoffs. And then the, re- then the NCAA can come in and have a playoff for the mid-majors, who's now Division I. Uh, you know, I mean, you could, f- you could see that coming down the pipe possibly because um, there, there's going to have to be more consolidation made for the Big East teams to survive. Uh, I mean, when you look at them from a university standpoint, from a basketball standpoint, there's some still some strong programs left there. Football-wise, not so much, um, but there's enough there to help make them survive and be absorbed into some of these other conferences. So that would leave what Conference USA as the other conference out uh, in the Big Six, aren't they the sixth one right now? Yes. And so, you know, I, from my conversations with individuals at mid-majors, um, you know, like an MTSU or a Western Kentucky or, you know, I'm using those for the proximity and those are people I have contacts at. You know, some of those people up at Western, you know, the rumors are up there, they're not wanting to have conversations with the Conference USA to go from uh, where they are, even though just they went into Division One not too long ago in the football program. They've got a great stored basketball program. They're not sure if they want to have those conversations to go into a conference like Conference USA and then turn around and it be dissolved. Uh, and now they could be left out holding a bag with nothing to do. So they're, they're kind of sitting there in a wait and see kind of thing to see what might actually happen uh, with all of this in a Conference USA in a Big East. Because who knows what can happen with your Middle Tennessees, your, uh, you know, Boise State's able to make that jump and they, they're, they're secure. But uh you know, those different programs like that, it's a whole other ball game. USF, UCF down in Florida, uh, Florida Atlantic. I mean, those are programs that have a good football. Uh, it's a short history, but they're starting to have a good football history uh, and building programs. And there's a ton of talent down in Florida. Everybody knows that. So that's how they're able to be successful. But what's going to happen uh, if this, is, this contraction hap- keeps happening and all of a sudden there's just four conferences with 16 teams? Uh, it would make sense if now you've got two eight two eight. Uh, eight team uh, conferences inside a, a super conference and now what you've got a, a built-in playoff there to go play for a, a four-team playoff from there it, it can work um who knows i don't know what your guys thoughts could be on something like that the main, the main thing is to not let anything like happen happen this previous year happen again none of the other big conferences in his personal opinion none of the other big conferences want to see the sec have you know, two teams have two teams and put up on a pedestal like was happening 
And it's rightfully so. Six, you know, what is it? Six in a row, seven in a row, seven in a row national championships now. But you know, that's that's the main reason why this is all happening. And it's that they don't ever want to see it happen again. No, you're right. If, if the, the two best teams should play for the national championship, and if it's two teams from the SEC, I don't think. Even though some conferences may not like it, but that's just the way it is. Well, it, if they're the two best teams, they got they should, they should play for it. And you think, I, from all indication, Mike Slive got that. Um, you know, by having this committee, and and Mike Slive's a commissioner of the SEC. If you're listening to this and don't know who he is, I don't know why you're listening. But uh, you know, I mean, that's what he's talked about from the beginning was that he wanted was a, a situation where you could still have the two best teams, and if they're from the same conference. Um, that's great. It just so happens that, you know, like you said, the last six years, the, the national champion's been from the SEC. Um, and I think if you go back to seven years, that's USC. Is that correct? And that's the year that was vacated. So it should have been Auburn. I mean, am I right with that? I think so. So, I mean, you could theoretically say if it's not the seventh year, it's seven out of eight years should be an SEC team. Um, and and my, I'd have to go back and look those up. But I know that that's right around the time that, you know, USC had to vacate their national championship, and Auburn didn't get to play as an undefeated team uh, for the national championship. They were left out of that whole conversation. So, and they, they came in and won their bowl game. So, you know, some people could argue seven out of the last eight um, are, are SEC champions or BCS champions. So, uh, you're right. Uh, the other, other conferences don't want to see that. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a very good opportunity that that's going to happen again this year, mm -hmm. uh, that the two best teams could be from the SEC. Um, you know, the way these schedules shake out, it might, you know, that's why we play these games, but it might not happen that way. Uh, so we're, we'll be interesting to see. And I did look that up. Uh, it, it went from the uh, 30 up to the 35-yard line. So it was last year at the 30. Um, the other thing that I saw was they're going to make a big notice about keeping the helmets on, uh, you know, the, all the helmets flying off for, for no particular reason. Uh, and what was kind of interesting in that was they actually had them track how many times during a ball game the officials, somebody, somebody's job, uh, probably hopefully an intern, uh, <laughs> was setting their count in the times each game in the SEC that somebody, a player's helmet uh, flew off. So they're going to try to take some actions on that. So, uh, you know, Spurrier was able to give his, his – uh, Jabs. He he was able to take a few jabs and uh, in Spurrier fashion down there. Uh, Saban was Saban, wouldn't we say that? I mean, no real surprises there. Mm -hmm. uh, LSU less miles, very mild manner this year. Uh, for for a team that, you know, if you you look at it, uh, I don't know if we covered this. I think we covered this preseason or before we started recording that basically twice as many people. Um, as far as voting in the preseason, votes is voting LSU to win the West versus Alabama, 129 to 65. Um, you know, for for that for him to have that kind of tout, you, you would expect Saban or uh, Miles to be saying something, and he was pretty mild mannered uh, at media day. So I think he's still recovering from that beating in the national championship game. Yeah. He very well could. I mean, he, he's got no no podium to stand on right there because he, he, he did lose in good fashion down there. Um, and th what is funny is, has, have you guys seen the new NCAA 12 commercials? Yeah. I will, those are pretty good. I like, I like the, I like that one in the Desmond Howard one with the Ohio state, uh, and the LSU tiger. Yeah. Is that the only two that's out there? Is there another one? Has anybody seen any of the others? I haven't seen the Desmond Howard one. I've seen the Les miles and the, um, Desmond. Ohio State kids playing it and yeah. up in his room and his dad walks in with the Ohio State shirt. <laughs> throws it at the window. And Desmond's doing his Heisman pose in a Buckeye uniform uh, and throws the TV out the window. <laughs> so uh, it's pretty good. Uh, but let's get straight into the uh, talk here. We'll, we'll transition into Heisman candidates. Uh, not a lot, unfortunately, to on either team to talk about Heisman candidates. Um, but, uh, you know, Aaron Ro or now, Jordan could actually come in and surprise some folks. What do you think? Do you think he could get in the talk late in the year? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, he's he's a pretty good quarterback, but he, he will not get in that conversation. I think the only player from Vanderbilt that actually could even just enter the picture would be Zach Stacy, the running back who had over 1,000 yards last year, and he'll um, he's coming back as a senior. But this year he'll actually probably be splitting, splitting some carries with Warren Norman, who set out last year with, with, with a couple of injuries. But now, 
I mean, he's, he actually has a, a, a pretty legitimate chance to break the all-time rushing record there, doesn't he? Yes. He, well, he, I think he broke the single season last year. Yeah. And uh, But, like, all-time, he only needs, like, six or 700 yards. So that, He should get it, but, I, but with Warren Norman coming back, I think they like just splitting them up because Stacy took a punishment last year in a, in a lot of games. Well, and he's not as fast. I mean, it's not a speed thing for Zach. No, nah, he's, he's more of a power runner. But, I mean, he, he broke a few runs off. Late, uh, he broke one long one against Ole Miss. Broke a couple against uh, uh, Arkansas. So he does. He can, he can run. I, I'm not saying that, but yeah. I mean, you know, he's not, uh, you know, Chris Johnson. Right. Yeah. He's not. He's not a uh, track guy. Yeah. So, <laughs> but and because of that, you take a beating. Right. You know, you're you're going up the middle. You're getting pound. You're pounding through there, and and it's not. You're fighting for those yardages. You're not just getting able to break around the the corner there and break free for 80 yards at the drop of a hat uh -huh. and not be touched you get punished every time you touch the ball so let, let's since we've transitioned over to Vanderbilt we'll talk about them for a few minutes and I know Cole's probably I don't know how much you can interject there uh, but uh, feel free at any point uh, if you've got something that you want to bring in with Vanderbilt we'll we'll be happy to let you but uh, Chad Caldwell is our resident Vandy fan as he's sporting his hat today uh, you know how's it how's how's it feel on West End I mean is it a it's a new feeling over there? Lot, uh, lots of excitement, uh, new turf, new scoreboard, new hill going behind one of the end zones. Now, did they sell the old? Were you able to go buy the old turf? Uh, no, it's at, some of the turf is going on the hill they're making behind the uh, one of the end zones. But I did not buy any of the turf. I think they were actually putting it on one of the intramural fields, so that'll be good for the for some of the students to use. Now. Uh, is the new Jumbotron going to be ready for the season? Yes, they should be putting it up in the next week or two. Okay. Uh, they got the, the turf down. It's basically pretty much done. Yeah, I saw so. a picture. They did, they did an updated uh, – I think they tweeted it, somebody from Vandy, mm -hmm. uh, through the construction there. It's getting pretty close last it, it, week. Yeah, it, it – uh, of course, they got this live stream you can watch on it, and it's pretty cool to just watch – from where it was to what it is now, so well, I wonder if they'll do like a time lapse at the end, so you could. I'm sure. That'd be yeah, they're big on they're right now. They're just big on marketing things, so I'm sure they'll put that together for people. Now, did you go down to West End to watch the new uniforms get unveiled? Yes, <laughs> I did. I did do that. Uh, I thought about you when I saw that. Yeah, I was, I was down there for sure. I definitely like the new white helmets. I can. Uh, I, w I w hope they wear those every game, but I know they won't. So now they w they pulled those out a couple times last year, didn't they? Not the white ones. White ones are brand new. They pulled out the black ones black a couple ones. times last year. The all black looks good. The all white looks real good. So. so the the white ones last year weren't all white. Um, not not with the white helmet. Okay. Yeah, they, had, they still had the gold. They usually wore with the gold helmet with all white. Okay. So that was the change was adding the white helmet versus a gold. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now they got all, they got gold gold helmet, black helmet, white helmet, and then a bunch of like, combos that I can't even begin to talk about on there that take a couple of hours. So are they are they turning are they going to fill up at Nike in Oregon there? Are they trying to enter that fray? You know th that was the big controversy if you if you get on message boards or something pe people were like we don't we don't need to look like Oregon uh but then, like, after the ceremony or the uniform unveiling, people were like, well, they're too plain. So, you're just not going to – I liked them, so – and the players liked them, so that's all I really care about. Well, I, and, and Vandy's not the only one doing this this year. You know, this year, Arkansas got, Arkansas has got new jerseys. Missouri has new jerseys. You know, it's exciting for teams like Vanderbilt for these, you know, for these new jerseys. exciting for the players. I, I guarantee you James Franklin loves it. It's a great recruiting tool just to have, you know, new, fresh uniforms. But – um I think it's a little silly for fans to think that they're going, you know, they're going the uh, Oregon route because uh, I, I think it's fun. I think it, I think it brings some excitement to game day too. Would you rather your team go the Oregon route or the Maryland route? <laughs> the Oregon route. <laughs> yeah, me too. And, and see, I like I liked those Maryland helmets. The 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 two. I think you're the only two. I, I one of the only the, two people. I think you're the only. I don't even think their coach liked them. <laughs> but you know, you're you're talking about the fans, and the average Vandy fan is not you. They're about. 30 years older than you. Uh, they've lived in Nashville all their lives. And, you know, they make a lot of money. And they don't get why the uniforms are, are being changed. They're not being changed for them. They're being changed to, like you said, for Franklin to go out and recruit with them. Right. Uh, it's his tool. It's something that he can give to the kids um, 
to bring in new talent. And that's why Oregon does it. It's not because they just like to change up uniforms. It's because the kids like to see all the cool uniforms. You know, with the new glove, the two gloves that you put them together and stuff. Uh, Texas has their new gloves. I don't know if you saw it. It's got the state in it. Uh, you know, Bandy needed to do that with the oak leaf. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, there's lots more to talk about with Vanderbilt than besides just their their turf and their uniform. Um, you know, from a, a player standpoint, uh, offensively, I think they're returning most of their players. Are they not? Yes, um, Jordan Rogers returning at quarterback. Zach Stacy at a running back. They return uh, their top three wide receivers in Jordan Matthews, Chris Boyd, Wesley Tate. Uh, they also return their tight end, uh, their tight end, Austin Monahan, along with a couple of freshmen that played a little bit last year. They'll be able to fill in. The, the big question mark on offense is the offensive line. They lost a couple of guys right there. They also had to move their best offensive lineman, Wesley Johnson. They had to move him to, to center about halfway through the season last year just to get some consistent play. And because the, the center that was there was kind of – was he, he actually got hurt, but he, he was actually prone to offensive fouls. You know, Less per, effective than per, they needed per, him to yeah, be. Yeah, personal fouls. So they kind of – every time they jerked him out, they'd have to put Wesley Johnson at center. But now they're they're moving Wesley Johnson back to left tackle where he's more comfortable. Okay. And they're going to put Spencer Pulley, who's a sophomore. He'll be uh, he'll be playing center, and hopefully that that's going to be their best line combination if they can keep Wesley Johnson at left tackle. So that's going to be the big question mark. Can Spencer can Spencer Pulley do the job at center so they don't have to move, keep rotating guys? Well, and uh, offensively, I don't think I mean. It was a different team when they put Rodgers in last year, too. I mean, you look at statistics from last year, returning those type of fo – that, that nucleus of individuals, aside from your line play, you know, just a couple of spots there, you should see a really, really potent offense this year. If he's consistent. You know, he, he had two bad games last year, the UT game. He being Rodgers. Rodgers. Okay. He had two bad games last year, the UT game and the, the bowl game. The bowl game was worse than the UT game. The bowl game, he was downright – Pathetic. They had to pull him because the wind was a little was a little hard. He his ball. He he didn't throw a hard ball, so he's getting caught up in the wind. It just got in his head, and, and they had to pull him. But if he's consistent, I don't see why they couldn't be one of the top offenses in the conference. But their their question mark is one of their going into last season strong points was their defense. It's a it's a new yes. defense this year, is it not? Kinda. You know that they lost Casey Hayward, yeah, cornerback. He got drafted in the second round by the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Tim Fugger, their best defensive lineman, got drafted uh, in the, one of the later rounds by the Colts. And Chris Marv, who was the anchor of that defense at middle linebacker for the last four years, he um, he he graduated. So the question marks on defense is linebacker play. They're going to have to move their, their right side linebacker, Chase Garnum. They're going to move him to middle. And actually Tristan Strong, who's coming off an of ACL tear, he's going to replace Garnum at the, at the right linebacker. Some freshmen they brought in, Darion Herring, he's going to be expected to play. He's a midterm enrollee from Georgia. He's going to have to step up and play probably. And who's going to be the opposite of Trey Wilson is at that other cornerback? Is it going to be Andre Howe or Eddie Foster? Eddie Foster has, been, has played a lot in his career, but he's been known to uh, get burned a few times because he's aggressive. So if they can find another corner to go on the opposite of Trey Wilson, they should be okay. And I think their defensive line will be strong with the guys they got returning. Well – one thing that I know when and, and I'm not a huge recruiting guy, but there's a lot of new new talent that, that's making Vanderbilt deeper than they've been in a number of years. I mean you look at some of the positions they, they drafted or I wouldn't say draft, uh, they signed a number of individuals that actually played quarterback in high school. Uh, and and they're able to move those to different positions. I mean there's some of them are going to what wide receivers, right. some corners. That's, that's a good point. Uh, Chris Cantera who's brought in as a quarterback last year, he has moved to uh, kind of like the H-back position. And he, uh, from all accounts, he had a great spring. You know, Jordan Rogers was talking about him all the time in interviews, uh, how great a spring he had. He's got good, really good hands. Also, Josh Grady, who they brought in as a quarterback, they have moved him to a wide receiver. They'll probably run some wildcat packages for him, like they did in the uh, black and gold game, the spring who, I mean, he ran for, he ran for a touchdown in that from the from the wildcat. And the difference that you're going to have is he's a, he's a true quarterback, so right. he can – I mean, you're looking at somebody that also that also has that run throw. option, but but he is a legitimate person back there for the to throw the ball. Yes, he's he is actually going to be this year. He's going to be like the third string quarterback. Uh, they signed Patton Robinette out of Maryville. 
who was a midterm enrollee, but they want to they want to keep his red shirt on. So if something happens to Rogers and our the backup Austin Carter Samuels, if God forbid both of them go down the same game, they will put Josh Grady back at quarterback before they burn uh, Robin Ed's red shirt. And it's nice to have that kind of depth. I yes, mean, especially in those key type positions there, and and that's where you're really seeing Franklin's mark on Vanderbilt is coming in and signing some good quality players that's giving depth in some key positions uh, that, that weren't there before in, in, in a Vanderbilt era. Right. Uh, Josh Grady, even though he, hadn't, he hasn't played a down yet because he, grad, he uh, redshirted last year, he may be the most popular guy amongst the fans on the team because he, number one, he's a great kid, and number two, he's a great recruiter. I mean, he's on, if, you, if you're on Twitter and you're following him, he's always talking to recruits. He was big on getting some of the recruits last year. So he, he may be the second-best recruiter behind Franklin on, on that, in that program. So there's a career in coaching when he graduates? Yeah, yeah. I think he's actually planning to be a doctor. But uh, <laughs> if doctor doesn't work out, I'm sure he could, he could be a coach. Uh, only, to be, only at Vanderbilt do you have somebody like that. What other bright spots do you see in Vanderbilt's future? I, I like the, the freshman class they brought in, you know, uh, most services had it in the top 25, some just right behind the top 25. Uh, running back Brian Kimbrough out of Memphis, he was a four-star recruit. He's, he's small, so he's not going to be a power runner, but he's going he's gonna to help a lot in the return game. He'll probably be the kick returner opening night. Uh, they're going to put him in the slot, run reverses. They're going to try to get the ball in his hands. Uh, defensive end, Caleb Azubike, he was a four-star guy out of McGavick in Nashville right down the street. So uh, he's going to play a lot. And if you see him, the other day we, me and my buddy went to watch him play 7-on-7 seven seven with each other, against each other. And uh, he – not that this is – I mean, I shouldn't talk like this really, but he had his shirt off and he was pretty ripped up So <laughs> for a freshman. So he's, he's going he's gonna to have to play a lot. Uh, and, uh, again, with the linebacker, the linebacker Darion Herring, who is midterm and he he will have to play at linebacker. I think you just gave us our, our title of our podcast. <laughs> uh, it, it just feels weird saying that, but he did. He was, he is ripped up for a freshman. I got to write that down so I don't forget. Um, all right, you mentioned you know that opening night, and we'll, we'll let's go on and just go through the schedule for them. Uh, and and what I've done in the previous weeks is is ask. Um, wins or win or loss, and that way we'll f- figure out where you think they're going to end up with uh, in the total. Um, because sometimes we've realized that I can ask you how many wins you think they're have, and then when you go through it, that number can be higher or lower when you break it down by team by team. Okay. So we'll go. I think th- I think actually the I think the year I'm, the that first game is important. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, there's going to be a lot of hype, a lot of. Uh, very first I mean, game just in the in, intensity first game of the year ESPN Thursday night not only for the Vanderbilt but for football college right, football right yeah. that, that's going to be a big game but you know Franklin last year proved that you know if you lose a tough one the next week they they bounce right back so and you've got the luxury of that being at home how cool how how big is that for Vanderbilt it's 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 real big cuz they played some big games at home at night you know the Auburn game uh, four four years ago, it was on. It was college game day, the game, and uh, they won that one when, when everybody thought they'd just lay an egg because it was on national TV. So that, that, they've had some pretty big games, but I think this is going to be one of the biggest. All right, so South Carolina, where do you think at the end of the night, win or loss? I'm going to say a close loss. Mm-hmm. I'm saying this as a podcaster, not a fan. All right, well, as, a, as a fan, if you were, if you were, <laughs> yeah, I want you to be realistic because if you're yeah. a fan, you're going to tell me they're going to win every game. Right. Yeah. And. I, and we gotta we gotta think logically when we talk about a podcast. I'm gonna so. say probably 24, 21 loss. All right. Uh, I, I I think you're right. I I do think that it's a loss for them, and I think it's gonna be closer than most people think. Um, but uh, you know, it only takes one play, and they can, they can bring up an upset because they're gonna they're gonna be the home team, and they are gonna be the underdog if you're gonna look at Vegas numbers. Um, so I agree with you there. What about at Northwestern? Win. Then they're gonna. All right. I'm not. Should I even ask? Presbyterian. I, th- I hope they win that one. <laughs> <laughs> Where is Presbyterian? I have no idea. Then they're gonna go play between the hedges at Georgia. I'm gonna say loss. Then they're gonna go play at Missouri, the Battle of the Franklins. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. If that game was at home, I'd give us a little bit better chance. But I, I haven't seen much of Missouri. But I'm gonna go ahead and say loss. Uh, then they're going to play – they're going to host Florida October 13th. I think that will be a real close game, but I think that will also be a loss. 
Auburn. I think they. I think they win that one. And then, Ma- then Massachusetts. They win that one. At Kentucky. They win that one. No offense, Shane. Uh, none taken. <laughs> um, I'm going to hate it when I get to the Kentucky podcast. At Ole Miss. I think they win that one. Sorry, Cole. <laughs> we'll see what Cole thinks in a minute. <laughs> At Tennessee. Or no, you host Tennessee this time. <laughs> <laughs> Drew's not here. Mm. I'm going to say they win that one because it, it's at home, and I'm sure the, Franklin will be playing Dooley's post-game speech to his From team last after year. all week. So I, I think they'll be ready for that one. And, and tell the fans that aren't didn't keep up with Vanderbilt a little bit about that last year because that was towards the end of the season, and if you weren't a Vanderbilt fan, it didn't get a lot of press. But around here, the Vandy fans sure talked it up. Right. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a coach, so I – I, we say things in the locker room that we don't expect anybody to hear. So I know what he was just – what Dooley was doing in the locker room. He was just firing up his team after the game. and But uh, he said on the lines of uh, if there's one thing we always do is kick the crap out of Vanderbilt, except he used another another Exploded, word for it. Right. Yeah. So, A podcast-unfriendly term. Somebody had a phone – phone uh, video – had a video on their phone and sent it on YouTube, and so everybody got to see it. Yeah. And, and, Which I'm sure he wasn't happy with whoever did that. Yeah. It's it's so funny how so many things are taken, like you said, out of basically out of context. I right. mean that's that's used as a motivational thing. He wasn't meaning any ill will to Vanderbilt, its right. fans, its players, or anything like that. It was a tool he was using, and I, I can't fault him. He might have done the same thing. I didn't. I, I didn't have a problem with it. It's I mean, great. He, but, he, he was. He's right. I mean, yeah. really. <laughs> I mean, even though I'm a fan of. Yeah, I don't even, but it, I don't think it should have got out though. But I, I don't blame for what he said. All right, so they're going to close the season at Wake Forest. That's a win. So that's got you eight and four. I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, that's that's barring uh, barring injury, barring uh, you know. Some some good bounces here and there. I think. I mean, I was just going by here. I think they'll be favored in five of those, in six of those games. Just looking at their schedule right now, I think they'll be favored at Northwestern, Presbyterian, UMass, at Kentucky, at Ole Miss, and at Wake. You know, so um, that, that's the games I think they'll be favored in. So if, you, if they win that one, I think there's a couple of toss-up games like Auburn and Tennessee that they can win. Yeah, and eight wins is going to give them a. a uh... Chick Fil A opportunity, possibly. Eight, eight wins will. You just never know with with the with the two new teams coming in how the bowl alignment's gonna gonna shake up. True. Um, but yeah. on a regular, eight and four would be, you know, Chick Fil A. Yeah. You might be in Shre- you might be in Shreveport for the Independence Bowl. <laughs> hey, I mean, I'll be down there. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever they send them, I'll go. So. All right. Well, I I, I like your. Optimism, uh, but you're, you're right. If you look at it on paper, um, each one of those close games that you you gave them a win, they could actually win. Uh, so, so I wouldn't say you were completely unrealistic with your with your goal there. So we'll give them eight and four uh, from Chad Caldwell. And uh, anything else you want to add about that Vanderbilt team on West End? Just lots of excitement. You know, we got a we finally got a, uh, a we finally got a coach who will fire people up. Who not many people. Especially friends of the East, they don't really like him very much. So it's kind of it's kind of cool that he likes to talk about them a lot. <laughs> let me let me ask you while we're talking about Franklin for a second. What do you think is the biggest thing that he brings to Vanderbilt? Is it his recruiting? Is it his coaching? What what swag? Swag. The swagger. He's bringing swagger to West End. Yeah, you know, he's. I mean, he. The biggest thing in Vandy is that they could play for three quarters. With, with about, with about anybody. But that fourth quarter, they're just going to get their butt kicked. But, I mean, he just – this past year – of course, they, they went six and seven, and to a lot to a lot of teams, that's a that's a bad year. But that was a team that was predicted to win two games. I was going to say, by, they, they came off of everybody. two years in a row with two wins. Right. So, so, I mean, it's not like he was – he came in there talking they were going to win 12 games or whatever, but it, he, he talked about just getting better, changing the culture, and they went six and seven. And and he's all about what finishing top four in every category. Have you have you heard him talk about that? I have not. You, I know something about I, James Franklin. I know you team. heard him speak one time. I don't think I've heard that though. Uh, you know he 
all the main categories that, that you look at, you know, passing, de defense, points scored, points allowed, those type of, you know, categories. I think there's 17 or 18 different categories, and he wants to finish in the top four in each of them. <laughs> now, last year, Vanderbilt didn't finish in the top four in any of them. Um, but, you know, he's got a long way to go. But you're right, it's the mindset that he brings to, to West End that that's his expectation level. doesn't mean that the, he's going to get there overnight, but – he doesn't, uh, you know. He doesn't. Gonna, he's not going to accept not having a, a good year and not finishing. Right. So I was, um, I was on a message board the other day, and there were there was this topic about pivotal moments in Vanderbilt football history. Of course, it was a bunch of stuff. But then this one post was when Gus Ma Malzahn said no. So I think I think that was I agree with that post right there because that when he said no and we turned to Franklin, they got the they got the right guy. We'll see how long we'll see how long he stays. Eight and four, it might be hard to keep him from some of them jobs that open up. You you say that, but Vanderbilt has already proven that they're they're willing to make investments now into sports. Right. I mean, for you can ask whoever you want to, and if you keep up with Vanderbilt uh, and and being in Nashville, even the, some of the casual SEC fans are a little more involved with what Vanderbilt does than others. But I mean, this is a program what five years ago that basically got rid of their AD. How many years ago was that? Uh, that was a little bit more than five. It was when Gordon, Gordon, Gee, Gordon Gee was who's there. at Ohio State, or is he, did he lose his job with that mess up in Ohio? Nah, State? he's still he's still there. All right, so, um, so when it Gordon, was it was probably at least ten years ago. No, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, I'd have to look that up, but let's just say it's been in the last decade. It has. Uh, you know, they they realized that sports was not was so inappropriate or so. Uh, insignificant on the Vanderbilt campus that they fired their AD and did away with that athletics department. No matter how they sugarcoat it today, um, they 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 got rid of their sports program basically, and it was all being done through the university. Yeah, but I mean, if you ask any of the coaches there, they uh, I mean they that they liked that system. They liked it so well that now this week or the last week they announced that Vanderbilt has an athletics director. Well, I mean, but it was the same guy that was always running it. But they they haven't lost a major coach to another school in the four major sports. Have they had a coach that's done well enough to lose to another? Tim Corbin, Kevin Stallings. Corbin was dis had a disappointing this year. Would you think? I mean, he had a he had a rebuilding year. Lost twelve guys to the draft. A record. They still went to a regional. Yeah, I I can give you Corbin, um, but Van Vanderbilt had their best season in basketball in years. First NCAA championship or sec championship in ever right is that the first time they've ever had an sec championship since, since 51 51 so it was yeah. their second but, i mean they went to the sweet 16 in 04 and 07 and stalling has had people calling he didn't go but i i understand where you're coming from with bobby that. bobby johnson goes to a bowl game duke's gonna offer him the job he didn't go it's duke i well, mean I know. is duke a, is duke an upgrade over vanderbilt Probably not, but, I mean, they haven't lost a coach in the four major sports to another school. But my point is that it, it, it was so effective that now they have an AD. And what it really says, and, and I'm not trying to, to argue back and forth with you, what I'm saying is that Vanderbilt now understands the importance of athletics in its program. It, it, the, the feelings that Franklin is bringing to West End is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, it – the person that's the AD now had other duties before he was AD. So he had to split his time. Now he gets to concentrate all his time in the athletics department. Right. He doesn't have to split that time. So it's a more of a focus that they understand that that focus needs to be there on athletics, that it's working, that they're doing the right things, and that it's important to them. And I say that only because they have gone deep into pockets that they've never gone in before to try to, to – Say how important athletics are on their program. Bring in the new facility, the new practice facility, putting the, the jumbotron out, putting the new turf down, giving Franklin a new contract. All of these things they're doing to step up. And, and I, I go on that just to say that if somebody comes calling, it's going to be hard to get him away if he's uh, successful. I mean, I guess I just disagree with – I mean, Gordon Gee had his vision of what a, what a private school like Vanderbilt should do with their athletic department. I don't think it anything, had anything to do with – um, not caring about athletics because you see during that time they went to multiple NCAA tournaments. Women basketball went to an NCAA tournament every year. Baseball went to the College World Series. Uh, numerous super regionals, numerous regionals. Football's been to two bowl games. So I mean, I don't, I don't think 
I don't agree with that that point that you made. That's the only thing I was saying. Okay, and and, and I think that that we're, we're going to disagree on that because they realize that athletics are so important. They need a guy that's dedicated full time to it, uh, or they wouldn't have hired, or wouldn't have made that announcement a couple of weeks ago. Would you agree with that or disagree? I mean, David Williams was the athletic director, whether it was at his title or not, but probably he needed to concentrate just more on athletics than his other stuff. All right. So I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> let's let's switch gears here and, and go a little further south in the SEC uh, and talk about Ole Miss. What's good in Ole Miss, Cole? We have a new coach and a new a, a new AD, which to any Ole Miss uh, fan is uh, welcome, welcome news. Um, Pete Boone and Houston Nutt um, became um, – very, very unpopular over the last uh, over the last eighteen months. Now, was uh, it the president or the AD that wanted to change the rebel? Um, that was the chancellor. The chancellor. And, and that was that was more of a uh, more of a chancellor move than any. Um, we won't get off topic on that and get a uh, because I know we could spend an entire podcast on that. But um, fans are excited. I believe that. Uh, you know, Houston. Uh, when we hired Houston out a couple of years ago, some some uh, some fans were a little shocked. Uh, you know, we did get a proven winner, which is what the uh, administration was looking for uh, to go with the talent that we had on the roster that um, Ed Orgeron could not uh, coach up, but could get the talent in. Unfortunately, the exact opposite happened with Houston Nutt. We had two good years with good talent, and then fell um, fell to the. Uh, seller of the SEC, and um, Hugh Freeze has been hired from Arkansas State. Hugh Freeze is a Mississippi boy. He was a high school, uh, high school football coach from Briarcrest in Memphis, uh, not, far, not far removed from that job, and uh, came on at Ole Miss when Ed Orgeron was there, learned the recruiting, uh, the recruiting trade from Ed Orgeron and his staff, and um, has – has made multiple comments about how the talent in, Ole Miss in Oxford is less than what it was when he left, when Orgeron was there, and probably worse than what it was when they showed up. So that's the biggest building, I guess, uh, hurdle that we have going forward. But um, everybody's excited. I, uh, I personally, when they said when they hired Hugh Freeze, it took me, it took me about a week or two to really get my get my arms around it and come to come to grips with the fact that we had a uh, we had hired, hired him and not gone after a big name and spent some money on a coach. But I think it's a, I think it's a great move. He's, like I said before, he's a Mississippi guy. He's a, his heart's all in it. He's a great motiv, great motivator. Um, got a great recruiting class, uh, recruiting class his first year, and as many of y'all know, his first year is most, you know, the most difficult one. He came in, didn't have uh, the entire year; just had a couple months to get the thing to get the thing together. I think we were in the top twenty. We were rated in the top twenty-five classes, recruiting classes. Got some pretty big names. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of excitement going on. The work ethic has uh, changed a lot. Um, the work ethic was semi-non-existent last year. The last year of the uh, Houston Nut regime. Um, it was more of a. Um, Would you say it was more of a street ball atmosphere in Ole Miss last year, where you know it was everyone was trying to prove them for themselves instead of being a team player? Oh, uh, definitely, definitely. I mean, we definitely had some talent. I think the most. Uh, and I use that. You think of basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, you only have five players that when you're playing street ball, it's every man for himself to prove. But you saw that sometimes on the football field, and I just wanted to see, get your thoughts on that. No, you're exactly right. Mike Mary, actually the linebacker, starting linebacker for Ole Miss at SEC Media Days, said that a lot of players last year didn't care and gave up too easily during games that they didn't expect to win. So um, you know that just says that just says a lot right there. We had talent. We had a. Uh, the talent we do have on the on the uh, on the team, I feel like the majority of it is in the lower classes. From uh, from two season two seasons ago when we recruited um, a couple of the um, top team top talent in Mississippi, and uh, last year when Hugh Freeze brought it in. So, you know, I think you, it's just a culture shock. You know, when not a culture shock is a bad words, but when they when Hugh came in there and gave them new motivation to get in there and work hard and we might not win every game this this season, which we definitely won't. Um, but um, but we're going to play 
all four quarters. You know, I go back to what Chad said about how Vanderbilt used to be and play three quarters in the fourth quarter, you know, lay, da- lay down and get run over. I feel like that was like it was last, uh, last year for Ole Miss, but it was more we'd play the first quarter, maybe a little bit of the second, and then the rest of the time once we got down, we just, we just quit and people started playing for themselves. Um, need to work hard, and um, hopefully in a couple of years we'll get, we'll get there. We'll get a little taste of what Vanderbilt's going through right now. <laughs> and it only takes a year, as Vanderbilt's exactly. proven. Uh, now, they, they're doing a completely different style of offense as well, aren't they? I mean, they're doing some changes there, quarterback issue or quarterback changes. Um, you know, the quarterback last year's now, they've, they've moved his position, right? He's, he's yeah. your re- wide receiver, is that yeah, right? Yeah, Randall Mackey, Randall Mackey was, uh, was one of the three quarterbacks we used last year. Uh, Zach Strout um, was also another quarterback. He, uh, he has left the football team because of metal, medical issues. And the other uh, quarterback that actually started the season last year, Barry Brunetti, who is out of Memphis, transfer, uh, transferred into Ole Miss last year from West Virginia. He is uh, currently in a – in a tight battle um, with Bo Wallace, who is a um, community college signee from Northeast uh, Northeast Mississippi, actually Hugh Freeze recruited him twice. He was a uh, he was at Arkansas State when Hugh Freeze was there and left to go to a community college, and now is a uh, should be I would think Bo's going to end up winning the uh, winning the quarterback race. He's more of a leader, according to a lot of people on the team um, right now, than Barry is. So. We do have a new offense. The good thing is Bo's run this offense before. Before uh, The bad news is when you install a new offense, you go from a run, you know, a run happy uh, SEC grounded out, grounded out game to, uh, to an up-tempo. You don't have the players for it. You don't have the players for it right, at, right, you know, right on the onset. You so. kind of run into what Florida did last year. Yeah. I mean, everybody expected them to come in. Muschamp, uh, you know, brings in uh, guy, uh, Weiss with the new pro-style offense, but they had the, the speed and the different players there. So, I mean, I guess it would be very similar to that. How well can they adjust? How quickly can they adjust to that type of program? And it's also a completely different way to run an offense. How quickly can they learn? Not not, not only perform, but can they learn that? Because it's, it's not a, a simple offense either, is it? No, it's a high-octane offense, very complicated. They actually have only got – um, they only were able to do about half of what they wanted to do during spring ball. Uh, the biggest issue right now is the offensive line not being able to keep not be able to keep up with what they want to do. But it's conditioning big, or speed or just all the, the speed, above. Just I think it's all the above. I think it's just the uh, the type of player we we have uh, we have a high you know it's like a fast break offense is what they're trying to they're trying to install. They want to be a fundamentally efficient scoring machine, according to Hugh Freeze and. Uh, if you look at his Arkansas State team last year, they were 16th in the nation in passing yards, uh, you know, 64th in the nation in, um, in rushing yards. That's compared to 107th for Ole Miss and 83rd, 83rd in rushing for Ole Miss. They scored, you know, Arkansas State was the 31st in the country in scoring. Ole Miss was 116th. So you're looking at you're looking at some of these things and. It's just a completely way and different way, you know. A new culture coming in. It's gonna be. I think it's. I'm excited. I'm very excited. It's gonna be more exciting, especially. And now, he's he's installing this offense, but there's also some holes. I mean, you know, one of the things that you need there's a good running game, is, is it not? And some question marks are still sitting there, and your running back issues. Yeah, we not actually, very deep, right? Not very deep. That's the biggest thing. Uh, Jeff Scott does return at running back, who he should be. He should be a really good uh, good SEC player. The problem with Jeff is he's not a great blocker. He's not a big guy. He's pretty he's pretty small. He's lightning quick, but he's not a big guy. We actually had uh, we actually moved one of our one of our wide receiver signees from last year. I think it's Tobias Singleton. I believe he's been moved to running back to help with depth. Also bringing in some uh, good recruits from the um, if you're from Nashville, you know Octavius Mathers from Blackman, who uh, who's run for over 2,500 yards the last two seasons in high school in high school he is uh he's an incoming freshman in Ole Miss I believe he'll get on the field and be from good. from day one from day one um he won't start but he'll come in and spell Jeff Scott so that's good but it, the majority of our depth we have to, you know, on the running back is we actually have two big fullbacks who in this offense don't really don't really fit so it's going to be an issue wide receiver wide receiver is a lot better um 
Wide receiver, I think we're good. We're young. Um, we have some good, some good young receivers: Jamez Logan, Dante Minecraft. Uh, we did lose and Mackie. I mean, Mackie's going to exactly. I mean, so Mackie's going over to Mikey's going to be a slot receiver, which is going to be great. And also, we mentioned the um, the Wildcat. I don't know how much we'll run that much of it this year, but Mackie would be a great a great quarterback for that. Wild, for obviously the Wildcat, yeah. because that's basically what he ran the entire year last year. Um, but it's going to be a struggle this year. Um, and then if you look at the offensive line, like I said, we're having troubles. Uh, we're having troubles. Our tight end, tight end's a, uh, another issue where depth is the bit, is a concern. Um, and I think that's all across the board on the offense. The good news is last year wasn't a good year, but we got a lot of youth, some experience, and I think that's going to uh, going to continue. Um, you know, on the defensive defense side of the ball, I think the defensive line. Um, the first team starters on defense are, are, are solid. Um, the problem there, again, is depth. Um, defense, uh, the linebackers. Linebackers, Mike Mary coming back. He's a tackling machine. Reminds a lot of people of Patrick Willis. Probably not on that level, but, you know, just all over the field, good speed uh, from sideline to sideline. Um, but you don't have – but we're filling gaps – with uh, converted DBs for outside linebacker position. So it's interesting. They're installing a new defense as well. So uh, Dave Womack's been brought up, brought in to run the defense, and uh, that's going to be interesting. Going to have some freshmen playing um, because of depth concerns. But um, a couple bright spots on the defense. You have Charles Sawyer, who is third team uh, All-SEC at defensive back. Uh, proven winner. Um, he works like a According to uh, Hugh Freeze, he just he's a maniac in his workouts. He uh, he gets everybody fired up, and um, so one of the finest players that Hugh Freeze has ever been around. Um, he returned a you know he returned a, a pick for pick for a touchdown against BYU last year, I believe, to you know give us a chance in that game. So he's going to be a great leader for us. Uh, another bright spot that most people in Oxford know this name, C.J. Johnson, huge recruit last year, was a true freshman last year. Um, came in as a middle linebacker, but has been converted to a defensive end. S uh, size might be an issue just because he's a little uh, a little small for a defensive end, but speed, Dave Womack is very excited about him and thinks he can be an all-SEC performer you know, for the next couple of years. So there's some bright spots, future bright spots to look for. This year's just going to be tough. And I think everybody in Oxford understands that, and we will um, go uh, go into the season knowing it, and see if we can sneak a couple wins wins out of it. And, and and one thing I will talk about, maybe you, I don't know how much you know about this, but you know before the season started, and they talk about this at media days to freeze, is that uh, you know you had a number of students anywhere from 30 to 35 students that might be ineligible coming into this fall for academics, and that number's down to. You know, four, maybe five. Yeah. Uh, and the the question was asked to him. You know, what what revisions have been done, and can he talk about that? Uh, my question, and I don't what what I don't see here is is how many of those academically troubled players are no longer on the team. I mean, because that's a real real easy way to get that number down is they're no longer on the team, and that that wasn't mentioned here. And I know no one's going to ask him that type of question at a media day. But what 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 information can you provide on something like that? I will say I don't know the exact number of people that are not are no longer on the team. But Jeff Scott was one of those academic um, people that could be an academic casualty. He's got his grades up, uh, been in class, got the tutors, you know, tutoring uh, tutoring for him. Really been working hard. I think it's the change in mentality with the team a lot these days is that's that's a priority now for this this coaching staff is uh getting to class making sure you're uh you're preparing yourself for your uh for education one huge well, and, one, and yeah. freeze made a you know there's a movie where he's exactly so, exactly so, so I mean, if, if any of you listening don't know hugh freeze is the head you know was the high school football coach of uh michael Orr, the you know the the blind side the blind side movie so um he knows a little bit about getting the kid motivated and uh, getting him academically eligible. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we can uh, we can talk all day about that. I will say one thing: one huge casualty of the academic uh, academics 
for uh, for Ole Miss, Nick Brazel, who was probably one of, if not the top athlete on our on our team last year, true freshman wide receiver. I think he scored. I think he had two, uh, four touchdowns last year, but just you know contributed in so many ways. Was playing on both sides of the ball. Uh, Hugh Freeze, when he saw him in spring workout, I'm sorry, he wasn't in spring workouts because of academics, but when he saw him on film, really truly believed that this guy could be an NFL an NFL corner. That's how talented he was. He didn't make his grades and has chose to, and chose to uh, withdraw from Ole Miss and plans on transferring to a, a new school. But um, you know, and you hate to see that, but um, sometimes you got to cut your you know you yeah. cut your losses. The kid, you know. D- Deserves a second chance wherever he goes, and uh, you know, wish the best for him. But we got to move on. But academics is a true concern. Hugh Freeze puts uh, puts a very big importance on that, as should most college coaches. Yeah. So I, I thought that was interesting, and and so you did, you were able to shed a little light on that. I mean, you know that some of that's going to have to happen. They're just going to have to go away uh, to get that number down. I mean, because that's a you're not just going to turn around 30 students and all of a sudden make them perform. So you're going to have to have some attrition. We'll say. Um, and, and like you said, there's been lots of cases where people have moved on and had a second chance at a Division II school, and have, you know they're able to come back and prove themselves. Uh, you know, I think there was a Heisman Trophy winner, number one draft pick a couple of years ago. That's right. That that proved that, uh, and it wasn't academics for him, but you know that second chances are needed out there. And uh, you know, there's a couple from the SEC this year that you know, Dyer at Arkansas mm-hmm. State. Now he's going to have to set out a year, but uh, from Auburn. But there's examples of that all over the board. So, uh, you know, and that's that's something you don't think about. Um, but looking through the media day stuff, I, I, that popped in my head. Wanted to throw that out there. Another thing was, you know, was there some comments from Spurrier? There was a it was a nice comment from Spurrier about scheduling when he asked uh, when he asked when he was asked about South Carolina's schedule and if he uh, if he helped to uh, put the thing together. He said if he if he had helped put it together he wouldn't be playing uh he wouldn't be playing lsu georgia would be playing lsu and south carolina would be playing old mess but <laughs> you know in true spurrier fashion has to get a dig in on somebody so it's all right i think that we uh i think that old mess fans realize the state we're in and uh you know took it it was took it pretty well <laughs> for, you have to take that at face value when it comes from the, the looking at the source right that's right well, we'll do the same thing with you that we did with uh, Chad just a few minutes ago. I'm going to go through these games and, and see what number you give me. You ready for this? Sounds good. All right. You start off the season with uh, hosting Central Arkansas. Okay, I do not think we pull a Jacksonville State. I think we uh, we win that game. All right. Then you host UTEP. I believe we win UT- the UTEP game. That's going to be a tough one. I, I understand. I understand it is, but I think – you know, I think the excitement about the new coaching staff, the new coaching staff is going to at least go in into the next week when we play Texas. Uh, it was announced this week that game is at 8-15 at night. Huge, uh, huge game for Ole Miss. Uh, national spotlight. Um, might even bust out the Powder Blues. If you're an Ole Miss fan, you might know what I'm talking about. But there's rumors about uh, some uh, throwback uniforms. But it's going to be exciting. Texas comes to town, and uh, from all I've heard, um, the game's going to be huge, well attended by all Texas fans and Owens fans. It's a really interesting matchup. But you going to make uh, that trek? I de- yes, yes. I will be there for the Texas game. But uh, we'll probably play play good for the first half in that one. But um, I think Texas will pull away. I do think that um, I am interested to see. I know Hugh Freeze talks about it, but I'm excited for this team to actually compete for four quarters. <laughs> So. Yeah. Well, and and I I can give you the win with UTEP if they they handle uh, you know Arkansas Central Arkansas well. If they play that game strong and do things right, you can see them building on that and have a chance at UTEP. If if they squeak by, or or it's sloppy, I, I would I want to definitely go go to town on that that second game. But I'm going to give them to you. What about Tulane? The Tulane. Tulane's interesting. Tulane is a uh, early morning, uh, early morning kickoff in New Orleans, um, which is not a, which is not exactly what you want to hear if you're an Ole Miss fan going it, down for a weekend. But, it's uh, rare to have a fourth, fourth week game already on the schedule for a time, too. No, it is. I think it's a Fox Sports, uh, Fox Sports game. But I think we, uh, Tulane's, yeah, you know, I think we got that as well. I think that uh, that might be our last win of the season, but I think we can go down there and win. All right, so I'm I'm guessing you know the answer for the Alabama game. Loss. A&M? Loss. 
Auburn. Loss. We're going through these. Just tearing through these. We're going to get through these in no time. At Arkansas. Loss. At Georgia. Loss. Vanderbilt. I think it's close, but uh, I agree with Chad. I, I, I think that Vanderbilt's got got a little bit more. I think it might go down to late fourth quarter. Um, if for, none other re- for no other reason as we're going to have a, at that point, I think we're working on a 16-game SEC losing streak. So add five to that. So a 20-plus game SEC losing streak going into the Vanderbilt game, if my prediction is correct. That um, might be some extra motivation to, to beat Vandy. But I believe, before we go any further, the one thing I did want to say, I think that um, we probably have, if not the hardest, one of the, one of the top five most difficult schedules in the country. If you look at our SEC schedule, um, playing, you know, three top ten. I'm looking at this really quickly, but you're looking at LSU, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia. Those are the four – those are the four away games, and those are all top ten teams. Probably two of them being top five teams. You play Texas for one of your – you know, and then, you know, you get – um it's gonna be it's gonna be difficult. It's, so, but we'll you know. But hey, if you're gonna be down, you might as be well have a tough schedule when you're down. So, but Vanderbilt, I think we lose. I think it's gonna be close. LSU, uh, we always seem to play LSU really well. LSU is just way more talented than we are. We'll lose that. And Mississippi State, Egg Bowl, um, Egg Bowl. I really I don't know. Um, they've got more. They've they've definitely uh, got more talent on the roster. Uh, Dan Mullen has energized that fan base as an Ole Miss fan. I really – he gets under my skin <laughs> so bad. Uh, so much more than Jackie Sherrill and, uh, of, did uh, back in the day. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think i got to give it to State. i got to give it to State at least one more – I think one more year. We just don't have the – we just don't have the team this year to – Get things going. So I'm looking at three and nine. Yep. Athlon's, That's being realistic. Athlon's got them four and eight. So. So. Who's They're, Athlon got them beaten? It doesn't say. It just gives them the projection. Oh, okay. Um, I guess it's got to be Mississippi State. It must be. Or or Vanderbilt. They're giving yeah. them one of those two because they're saying they're going to win one in the SEC this year. Right. So I don't see them winning one of the other games in the SEC they have on the slate. Those are the only two that they have an opportunity, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. Um. So. All right, guys, that wraps up our, our two-a-days as far as our rundown of uh, Missis- Ole Miss as well as Vanderbilt. I want to thank Cole Hodges and Chad Caldwell for coming in and, and doing this for us. And we end every podcast, of course, with an open mic. Uh, just uh, your time to tell whatever you want, sports, non-sports uh, related. And, uh, Chad, you want to kick this one off? And we'll wrap this up here in just a few minutes. Yeah, I think I'm going to go outside the SEC and talk about the uh, the Penn State case. Okay. The, supposedly they're going to NCA is going to be throwing the hammer at Penn State tomorrow. Um, from reports that they're not going to get the death penalty, but they're going to get something as close to it as they can get. My my thinking was when as soon as the free report came out that Paterno knew basically what was going on the whole time and just basically just kind of kept it hush hush to protect his program and then the board I thought I thought they should get the death penalty and then when the board the Penn State board said that they were going to leave the statue up I said they have got to get the death penalty because they just don't understand what's going on here but now since they th- this morning they took the statue down I think now people can start to the healing process up there but I'm in- interested to see what what the NCAA is going to bring down. I'm sure it's going to be bowl bands, scholarship bands. Uh, I wonder what they're going to do with the players. Are the players going to be able to transfer with that penalty? Uh, because you know a lot of these coaches around the country are looking at that roster right now and thinking about who they can get that's going to help them out in the fall. Yeah. So I, I no longer – since they took the statue down, I don't think they should get the death penalty, but I think definitely something's going to happen, and I'm looking forward to see, seeing what that is. And I hope the players that are there now are not – they can transfer without, without having to sit out a year. Now at SMU, when they they were the last team to get the death penalty, right? The only the first, yeah, first and out. First, now, yeah, their players were not allowed to transfer, were they? Yes, they were allowed. They were. Okay, so you could. You I'm could. pretty sure they're going to allow them to transfer without sitting out a year, but it's going to be in- interesting to see who leaves, who stays. Because the death penalty is zero 
athletics, right? For they, a year. Yes. They can't play completely different. Completely. Uh, yeah, they can't even practice for a year. And then the next, the following year, the year after that, they can practice. They can't play games. That's at least how they did with SMU. So, I mean, that's for a program like Penn State, that's just earth shattering to think that they're not going to be playing football. Maybe next year you think it would happen as early as this? They would, would they play this season? Or they would just. I think, I think they're going to allow them to play this season. Okay. I don't think they're going to get the death penalty, but I don't think they're going to be able to go to a bowl for three or four years, maybe more. I don't, I'm not sure. I feel sorry for that new coach that went up there, though. <laughs> but, I mean, realistically, and, and is, is a bowl ban that big of a deal for Penn State? Because they're going to have such a hard time getting recruits there over the next four to five years anyways. The chances of them going to a bowl is going to be small. Yeah, but if, if it's a long enough bowl ban and You're gonna, a scholarship reduce, reduce the number of scholarship, they, it's going to be hard for them to do anything, really. So it it's, might, might as well be the death penalty. It, it would help them in, lo- in the long run, I think. I mean, just to, you know, do away with it and then start fresh anew. Yeah, but I think they'll lose too much money. They ain't going to do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. We'll know soon. And I don't even know if it's the right thing for the NCAA to be involved with it. I mean. Wh- I've heard other people say that. I just think that. I just think that this is one of the worst things that's ever happened in collegiate sports. I mean, and that was a guy that was, hey, who had quit coaching in what was it, oh one, three years after like the first supposed first incident or whatever, but then still hung around the program, and he was in the stands for when Joe when Paterno broke the wins record. I I'm not discount anything that I mean for the as far as what had happened. It's just where 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 does the NCA Double A come in, and what grounds do they have? Are they going to say institutional I control? It, I think it's because you had janitors there that knew what was going on, but was too afraid to say anything because they thought Paterno was would have them fired. I think they that it, the institutional control is going to come in that Joe Paterno ran that campus and did whatever he wanted to do. Because I mean, that's really the only thing that the NCAA could come on come to them uh, that I'm aware of that I've right. heard others talk about is is I mean because there's, there's nothing in recruiting or. Other violations that they could, you know, penalize them for, and and the death penalty for that one it's going to be kind of hard. But I guess we're going to know soon because it's expected tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. So by the time most people listen to this podcast, they'll already know what's going on there. So if people want to follow you on Twitter, is there a way they can do that? Yes, I'm at Chad Caldwell24. My account is private, so you can't just click on my name and see what I'm tweeting. I have to approve you first, and I do that for because I'm a teacher and. That's just what I do. <laughs> and, and there's good reasons for that. So. Yeah. So the normal SEC fan out there that's not one of his students, you know, they're Vanderbilt, want to know what's going on in Vanderbilt. Uh, I, I do tweet about Vanderbilt at least a couple times a day, tweet about the Braves right now since it's baseball season. So Some heated conversation between you and another podcast member, uh, Brett Young. A few, yeah. occasionally. Yeah, if it gets too heated, we try to call each other, keep it out of the public forum, <laughs> talk, about, talk about it in private. But. <laughs> All right, Cole, anything you want to throw out there on the open mic? I don't have much. Uh, you can follow me at, at MC Hodges on Twitter. And um, I tweet out a lot about Ole Miss and just uh, everyday news and happenings. But um, just to end this on a light, on a, uh, on a light note, had a, uh, had a very fun weekend with a group of guys at the bachelor party. And I wanted to uh, just let anybody out there that's ever in, ever in Nashville um, – if you want to uh, want to have a really really fun time, the call great, you for a ba- great, to go to the, the bachelor party. Well, huh? no, but <laughs> just let you know the uh, definitely uh, definitely don't miss the stage on Broadway. Probably the greatest uh, greatest bar known to uh, known to man. I've, so I've never started a night at the stage, but you always end up there. <laughs> but I've always ended one there. <laughs> that is there's there is that so. Well, I know you had a great time, and we appreciate you uh, being able to roll out of bed this afternoon to, to make this uh, podcast. And uh, I, I, I guess my open mic is uh, congratulations to Ernie Ailes. Um, you know, even if you got to come in the, the back way to get, get it, uh, it's still a well-deserved uh, trophy there on the uh, other side of the pond. Uh, it, I am correct, right? He ended up winning that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, feel bad for Adam Scott with, what, five straight bur- uh, bogeys? To, to basically give that one away, but uh, that's what happens over there uh, on those golf courses. But uh, you can follow me at P. Shane Bailey if you want to follow me personally. And with that, guys, we call this podcast done.